Okay, so welcome to Math 344, Mathematics of Sports. This is lecture nine. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to you know, continue and hopefully finish our talk about your know, Markov model for baseball and really answer the question about the relative value of hits. So we started uh, this conversation um, over the last few days and then Alex and Jacob were you know, kind enough to actually you know, set up the you know, calculation through a Google sheet. And so we can hopefully answer now the simple question of which is better, a triple or a home run? Okay, that shouldn't be a hard question, right? The answer, home run, right? You know, if we just ask which is better, it's really easy to say it's a home run. The really interesting question is how much better is a home run than a triple? And so here is the one expectancy. Do you remember? Which one you used for this? Uh, that's 2010 to okay, so this is 2010 to 2015. Okay, perfect, thank you. And so, you know, looking at that, this is telling us what is the expected number of runs for an average player coming to bat against an average pitcher in a situation like this. And the next plot or the next table is the probability that we're in each game state. So what should you be able to tell me about all of these numbers? They add to one. Now, of course, one of the things is if you look at this, do you think they're going to add to one? So you, we can start looking at some of the big ones. So this is about 0.25. Uh, maybe that's another 0.25, so it's about maybe a half just right over there, maybe about 0 0.63, 0 0.7. It's looking a little small, but maybe not so unreasonable because we do have a lot of things. But do you think it's going to add to exactly one? Not. Why not? Just because the decimals you're going to have rounding errors. So in something like this, you know, I really don't want you, know, you know, do I want two zeros over there or do I want it as four point something? You know, how much information do I really care about? Now, when you're doing a lot of these things on you know, the Google Sheets and whatnot, it's going to continue to calculate things and not display. There was a wonderful paper back in, I think the 1960s by Lorenz on trying to model the weather. And this is where a lot of chaos theory really took off is he had a simple model and he saw something interesting and he decided to investigate that further. And he was using you know, a deterministic model with you know, differential equations to describe how things evolved in time. And you can numerically approximate solutions to differential equations because these are very, very hard to solve in general. And so he put in the output of an earlier run. He said, well, look, I'm not going to run the first, you know, however many minutes, you know, that was boring. Let me just jump to where the good stuff happened and just investigate from there. And he had the computer print out the night before the values of the state. And when he put that in very quickly, the new state was not matching what had happened the day before. This can't be true. It's a deterministic process. And I'm putting in the same values as before. And then he realized, oh, wait a minute. The computer is only printing out to three decimal places, but it's storing things to six decimal places. So when I put things in, there was a slight difference in initial condition. And this led to um, one of the definitions of chaos, that small changes in the initial condition can very quickly lead to wildly different behavior. When we're looking at something like this, this shouldn't be that big of a difference if things are off by a little bit. But I would be shocked if these numbers added up perfectly to one, because you're going to have some rounding errors in something like this. It also gives you a sense of which states are the most important states to understand. So looking at this, which state do you think is the most important? No one on base and, and no outs followed by no one on base one out, and then no one on base two outs. You can't start an inning with a, oh shit, they've changed the rules of baseball. Damn it. 
When I was a kid, you can't start an inning with a runner on base. That is no longer true in baseball. Why is this no longer true in baseball? Yes. Yeah, in extra innings, they now start with you know somebody on second base. And as a baseball statistician, I now hate this because it does make it a little bit harder to you know deal with and adjust for statistics because now you're starting with somebody on second. Well, if you start with somebody on second with no outs, you expect to score one point one one, so you expect to score a run. And the whole point of this is to try to uh, prevent us from having extremely long baseball games. But in you know, most of the baseball games, you have to go through nobody on, nobody else before you can get to any other state. So it's not surprising that this state has the greatest probability. Okay, and so what we wanna do is we wanna study the value of the triple versus the home run. It's very easy here because they're going to clear the bases. And so uh, in this situation, it's very easy to figure out what's going to happen in each game state. Well, anybody who is on base scores, and in the home run, the batter also scores. In the triple, the batter does not score. So looking at this, you know, it's clear that the home run is more valuable than the triple by exactly one run every single time. So if we look at just what was the value, it's clearly going to be plus one run. But then you have to remember, but we do have a runner on third now. And what's the probability that that runner from third can score? Well, we can look over here. There's either going to be zero, one, or two outs. We just have to look at you know zero, zero, three. And so if we go across that row with no outs, I'm um, sorry, those are the probabilities that that happens. But now we don't really have to worry so much about the probabilities of those happening. We know we're in one of those states. And then you might say, what percent of the time do you think we're going to be in the state now of a runner on third, no outs versus a runner on third, one out versus a runner on third? two outs. Any thoughts? Yeah. Would you take that 0 0.002 number and then divide it by adding up three? Yeah, that's what I would do. I would say the relative probability that I'm here is I look at this row and I want to renormalize so that that row sums to one. So it'd be 0 0.002 divided by that sum. And that would tell me, all things being equal, how often do I expect? And so if I say 11 is basically the same as 14, then you know, about half the time, maybe I'm in one of these two states and half the time I'm in that state. You, know, you can do it more exactly. And then you can look and see, well, what's the value? Well, not surprisingly, there's a really high value of having a runner on third with no outs. You know, you're getting a 1.35. Well, the home run already gave you that one. And so if you look at having a basis empty, with no outs, there'd be a 0 0.481. If you look at a runner on third with no outs, it's a 1.35. The home run gave you an extra run. So this 0 0.481 is really a 1.481 for the home run versus a 1.35. Does it make sense that the home run is more valuable than the triple? Why? Yeah. Guarantees a run. It guarantees a run. You're not guaranteed that the runner from third will score. It's quite likely there's not a huge difference. You were talking about 1.48 versus uh, 1.35. But as you get more and more outs, now it becomes a little bit more sizable. Uh, 1.35 versus 1.09. Okay. And so you're here the value of having that runner on third is not that high. Well, if you think about it, what happens to most batters when they're at batters done? They're out. So you know, more than half the time for your know, most mortals, you're going to be out. So the probability of scoring that runner from third, now again, you could have a pass ball, a wild pitch or something like that. We're keeping things simple. But you know, these numbers are all very reasonable. Again, you're going to have some additional value because the run scored and you don't have to worry about it. So now what we can do is we can look at the gain from a triple versus the gain from a home run. And we can you know, normalize things and whatnot. And so when we're doing the calculation here, um, you can you know, confirm that I'm interpreting this correctly. You're looking at, I start at a given game state and then I look at what happens in terms of how many runs cross the plate and I now end up 
with a triple in the game state of 0 0 1 0 on third with as many outs as there were before. And I just add whatever that value was to how many runs scored. So if I started off um, with runners on first and second and no outs, I'm going to have two runs who score for my triple, and then I'll be left with a runner on third with no outs. So I should have a 2.35. So am I misinterpreting it? You take um, the expected runs from the zero, zero, three state. Right. And then subtract the expected runs from the initial state and then add the- Oh, oh, oh so this is, this is the gain over that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you're, you're looking at, I started off uh, with runners on first and second, which was worth 1.437. I end with a runner on third and two runs in. So that would be a 2.35. And so I do a 2.35 minus the 1.47. And that gives me the value that was added from the triple. Everybody good with this? I look at where I started. I look at where I ended. And that change is the value for the triple. It's what the batter contributed to the team. Okay. And so we can do this for all the different triples, configurations. And so when we're storing it here, we're saying this is the net change from having bases loaded, no outs, and then you hit a triple. And we can compare that to the one. And so we see that the game is not that much more from the home run with bases loaded to the triple with bases loaded. And it's the small difference of, if you have a one one third with no outs, it's quite likely that that runner will score. But if you had bases loaded two outs and we hit the triple, it's a 2.6 for the net change versus a 3.3. And so we see more of a difference there. Does that seem reasonable? You know, with more outs, it's going to be less likely that you're going to be scoring. And again, remember, we're subtracting off the expected contribution, you know, the expected value of what you would get in that initial configuration. If you have bases loaded and three outs, you know, a triple is extremely valuable because if you get out, then that's the end of the inning. Yes? Just to clarify, the normalized takes into account the the state of probability. Right, yes, exactly. And so you, it's not surprising to me that this is a much greater change than when there's no outs, because if the guy gets out, you still have more batters who have a chance to drive home runs. But with two outs, it's extremely important that you get the hit at that time. All right, and so now what we can do is we can look at the gains for each one of them, and we can multiply each one of these by the probability of being in that state. So what's the probability we started and the state of you know, base is empty, nobody out versus base is loaded, two outs. One of the things you always wanna do is quickly look and see, does the data look reasonable? Okay, I don't see any values here that are higher than the corresponding values there. You, know, you should never have the triple being more valuable than the home run. Other sports, that is not the case. Uh, can somebody give me an example in football where it might be better not to score? Like at the end of the game? Yes. You want to like burn clock. Yeah, the end of the game when you want to burn clock is you know, a lot of times, you know, I think it was in the Super Bowl, they should have actually tackled the guy from behind and pushed the guy into the end zone to get the ball back. And so there are situations where it actually might be more valuable to not score than score. In baseball, we're fortunately not gonna have that. And so when we do all this, the expected value of a triple is 1.033. The expected value of a home run is 1.42. And again, this is assuming that you face each game configuration with the same probabilities as everyone else in the league. These are reasonable assumptions. The only thing you might be a little bit concerned about is you know, there aren't that many triples that are hit. 
but hopefully the configurations for when that happens should still be similar. But you're not gonna have as much data for triples. All right, and so this gives us one way to start answering our question is which is more valuable, the home run or the triple? Okay, clearly the home run, but by how much? And so made a nice table here, you know, looking at your know, ratios, you know, triple to home run or home run to triple. You know, it's, which way do you want to normalize by? And if we were really going to do everything, what do you think we should be dividing things by? What should be the standard? Yeah, I think I would do everything by the single. And so over here, um, if you look at the home run divided by the triple value, um, okay, now you have the slugging, okay. The slugging is just saying a home run is worth four points, a triple is worth three points. And so if you do that, you get 0.75 or 1.333, depending on which way you do it. And so do you think that these values we're getting are pretty close or pretty far from just the slugging ratio of three fourths, four thirds? I, mean, I feel like three percent in one game might not be a ton, but over like a season. Oh, over over the course of a season, this is huge, and this is the opportunities that you have as a you know GM to exploit. But as a ballpark estimate, you know, to say, well, let's use the slugging values, and you know, a triple is your know, three fourths of a home run, or a home run is four thirds of a triple. Is that a ballpark reasonably accurate estimate of the relative worth of the two? I think so. You know, it's not something completely unreasonable where you're getting, you know, a triple is only half as valuable as a home run. You know, 0.728 versus 0.75, 1.374 versus 1.33. Those are all really good, reasonable numbers. And so to me, you know, this is a little bit amazing that you know, these nice integer ratios, which are coming just from how many bases do you get, seem to do a good job. Okay, any questions on this before we do the daily challenge? All right, so here are a couple of statistics. Batting average, on-base percentage, slugging percentage. And my question is, imagine you have two players who have the same batting average, on-base percentage, and slugging percentage. Are the two plays equally valuable? And before you answer that, there's another statistic that I could have put up with batting average on base percentage and slugging. What did I not put up? On base right. No on base plus slugging. For completeness, I have to ask why did I not include that? Yeah, it's implied. Yeah. Since on base plus slugging is the on base percentage plus the slugging percentage, if you have two players who have the same on base percentage and the same slugging percentage, they clearly will have the same on base plus slugging. So you're know, asking for that is not. So is it possible to have two players that agree in these three categories, but they're not equally valuable? All right. So. Okay. Okay, so, so one is to look at longer term things. Um, I remember when my son was starting to do soccer training, one of the things we commented on is if you have two players, one who's been through you know, intense soccer training for years and one who hasn't, and they have equal skills, I'd much rather have the person who hasn't had any training. They are more likely to be able to improve greatly. So I agree with you that you know, just because they have the same values for these metrics, you, know, you want to take a look at where are they in their career. There's of course other factors. It could be defensive factors, could be speed. But let's say that they have the same speed, they play the same position, they play defensively the same. Yes. Salary. They stay, let's say they have the same salary. So I know a couple of years ago, just because of the salary, what is the, in baseball, what's the most valuable player? How do you interpret that? So how do you interpret the phrase most valuable player? Okay, so one thing is you look at war, you look at what is the contribution to the, to the team from the player? Or 
you know, what are the numbers the player put up? There's another way you can interpret most valuable player. What's the other way you could interpret MVP? And this is related to your commenting on salary. Who has the highest value in that contract? Like who gets paid the most? Well, what is who gets paid the most? But I wouldn't say who gets paid the most. Percentage added. It could be also like RBIs, guys come, come up in like clutch situations. This is the effort. So, so one thing is you know the, the revenue that you're generating for the team, or it could be how much do you produce, maybe what's your war divided by your salary. And so, for instance, you might have somebody who has a much higher war, but their salary might be a factor of 10. And so by signing that more expensive person, even though they contribute more to the team, the value that they added is not enough to justify their salary. And so one way to you know, interpret most valuable player is to take into account the salary of the, we don't do this. You know, when we just determine you know, in leagues who gets the most valuable player, no one looks at, well, yes, you know, this person is being paid you know, 10 times more than this person. So if we take this other person, we could have shown up in lots of different ways. Uh, they do talk about this. If you haven't read Moneyball, I have a copy. I'm happy to loan that out as well as other books where when the Oakland A's lost certain key players, they were like, well, look, we don't have the salary to keep these players. We just have to reproduce their production at that cost or less of what we were doing. So for us, when we say most valuable player, we're not going to take into account salary. <laughs> but if two players, yes. I mean, just to think of an extreme example, I wonder if it's a clear difference. Like, if player one hits a home run and then just gets walked continuously, right? And player two just consistently hits home runs, they're gonna have the same batting average. They're gonna have the same on base percentage, and they're gonna have the same slugging percentage. But well, wait, wait, wait. So you have, but if one of the people is being walked, that's going to increase the slugging, increase the on base percentage. Right, but wouldn't wouldn't that so their their on base percentage would just be one, right? Because they're they're on base. Oh, so you're saying two people who never get out? Yeah, exactly. Like two extremes. Of okay, good, good. So I, I love that you're being a smart ass. No, this is this is a technical term. Is you want to say, well, what if I do something like this, and then I don't have to worry because you, if they walk, it's not going to change the on base percentage. It's not going to change the batting average. It's not going to change on base plus slugging because of the stupid way we're combining things. Okay, so in your situation where you have. Um, one person walks a lot. Walks a lot, hits one home run, so that their slugging percentage is also at four. And they have um, one single. No singles, right? Like the, the one player hits a home run and then just gets walked. The other player just hits home run. Oh, okay, okay. Good. So, so they'll have the same slugging percentage and the same everything. Good. So I will have to include the smart ass. So. Player one, one home run, rest of walks. And then player two, um, all home runs. In this case, clear player two is going to be far more valuable than player one. Excellent. So when you have a question like this, this is exactly what you should do is look at extreme cases. So my son and daughter have you know, this week off from school. And so my son's been learning a lot of card tricks. And so he's you know, been doing them to me. And he's not always amused with my participation. <laughs> so you know, on one of the tricks, you know, he says, okay, now cut the deck. And I cut the deck by taking 51 cards and putting the bottom card on the top. Well, that's... So as long as the cut wasn't too short, the trick will work. And so I'm always trying to think, where can I try to push things? And so you, he doesn't want to say, don't be an asshole, do a normal cut. Or you, know, you can try to phrase it as, you know, just to make sure that it's not going to allow me to see anything from the top of the bottom, leave at least 10 cards on each side, just something like that to just make sure you don't get into some extreme situation. All right, so if we have a situation like this, we know that we can have two players that are equal in all of these. So what about for normal, normal games? So I'll have you just think about this for a few moments. 
You can talk with each other if you want. I'm going to hit pause. But can you have two normal players? So by normal players, you're above the Mendoza line. Anybody want to tell me what Mendoza line is? Who knows their baseball? Mendoza was basically like a quadruple A player. You're going back and forth between triple A and the majors. Not good enough to stay up, but you know, too good to just stay down. And when you, you need, so they often say if you can't you know, bat at a certain level, you know, unless you are like a phenomenal catcher, you know, you're not going to survive in the majors. And it's around you know, 200 is the threshold for, you've got to be able to at least do that if you're going to stay up. So we'll assume you're batting at least 200. Yes? Is it frequency? Like because these are averages, like there's a huge difference if someone's you know, hitting 300 on like one attempt versus like 10 attempts. So good. So we'll say normal players, and we could say maybe, you know, same number of at bats and plate appearances. So, you know, again, what I'm trying to do now is remove all of the smart ass answers. Uh, yes. So if they have the same number of at bats and plate appearances, they get walked and hit by catches the same level? Exactly. And so for simplicity, you might just assume, you know, never walked, never hit by pitch. If you do something like that, then you don't have to worry. Or you could just say, or done equally. All right, so I'm going to, does everybody understand? So I want you to be hitting at least 200. I want you to be hitting below 400. You're not getting a home run every at bat. Right? Yes. Yes. Like to so say the team, to so the team, right, in terms of trying to generate victories. So does everybody understand the problem? All right, I'm going to pause the recording. So we were talking, um, some people were mentioning about you know, team chemistry and certain people could be you know, more valuable than others in certain situations. Um, as an aside, you know, in baseball, you do have the pitcher catcher chemistry. One of my favorite examples is Tim Wakefield. Anybody remember him? He was a knuckleball pitcher for the Red Sox. He was phenomenal at eating up innings. He's not a number one starter, but he was a great pitcher. We had a catcher who was able to catch the knuckleball, and that's not an easy thing to do. But he was sick and tired of being the backup catcher, so he eventually went to the Padres, but wasn't really good to get the uh, starting world there and decided he'd rather come back to the Sox and you know, catch Wakefield and be part of the team. The Yankees tried to take him, not because they wanted him, but because Wakefield wasn't as effective if they couldn't get him. And so he was traded back to the Sox. And in fact, I think he landed at Logan Airport in Boston the day of a game. And there was a police escort you know, to get him to Fenway Park you know, in time because he was able to catch Wakefield. You know, his value was tremendously more valuable in a situation like this with the Red Sox than it would be for a generic team. And so when you have a question like this, you know, you could always come up with you know, specific situations where these other factors are going to be important. But I wanna just ask the really basic question. Imagine I have two players that are equal in terms of their batting average, their on-base percentage, and their slugging. And let's say every other category, they're the same, the same team chemistry, the same speed, the same defensive abilities, is one more valuable than the other? And is there anything we've done in this class that might be useful for answering this question? So what might be useful for answering this? What have we done that might help answer this? Making sure it's being recorded. Yes, it's recording, good. So what have we been doing that might actually help us answer this? Okay, which ones? Okay, and how, how might one expectancies matter? What might we want to look at? Yeah. When you're getting your 
So one possibility is when you're getting your hits is if we have a lot of information, uh, who's Mr. October? Reggie Jackson, and he got this name because of clutch hitting you know, you know, in the playoffs, that when they at bats really mattered, he performed. Anybody know the derogatory uh, similar name given to Aroid? I'm sorry, Arod, sorry. It's just that replacement to it. It's, it's, it's hard to say something. So Alex Rodriguez, anybody know what he was called? I think for years he was called Mr. May in some circles because he would get the hits when they didn't really matter. There's a huge literature about whether or not there's such a thing as clutch hitting in baseball. And you can always point to a couple of people who are clutch hitters. Well, when you have a large enough sample size, you'll get some people who will come out as clutch hitters. You'd be surprised if you didn't. And so the question is, how many people are coming out as clutch hitters? How many would you expect if things were just random? So it could be that if I have two players like this that have similar statistics, maybe one of them is better at situations that matter. When you know, the bases are loaded in two outs, they come through for you, and they just don't do so well when the bases are empty. That they get their hits at high leverage situations. So let's add another assumption. Um, Hits. Um, be careful. Hit. Similarly, independent of game state. So, for example, if I have a profile that you. Know, 20% of the time I get a single, 10% of the time I get a double, and so on and so on. That's independent of what the game state is. I don't somehow do better than my profile when it really matters. Because if you had something like that, then clearly you could easily have one player more valuable because they get their hits when the hits really matter. So you know, again, it often takes a while to come down to what is the right question you want to ask. So now, They've got the you know, same number of at-bats, plate appearances. They have the same you know, walk, hit by pitch stuff because then that allows us to say batting average is the same as on-base percentage and just make the analysis a little bit simpler. And we can say that we're not going to have clutch hitters. They're going to perform the same way independent of the game state. So do you think that the plays will be equally valuable if they have the same batting average, on-base percentage, and slugging? Or do you think that one way of getting these numbers might be more valuable than another. Well, it could be if, like, for slugging, a guy could hit a home run in a single versus the other guy could hit a double and a triple. Okay, good. So that, good, excellent. That, that's the simplest way to do it, is, you know, compare a double and a triple versus a home run and a single. So this would be, same batting average, same on base, same slugging. So which is more valuable, the double triple or the home run and the single? But well, we would need to do the analysis. We've only done the analysis to compare the home run versus the triple. We would need, we, we know how much more valuable the home run is to the triple, but we need to figure out how much more valuable is the double to the single. There's another way we could do it. So we could compare, um, let's do n sub three triples versus n sub four home runs and n sub one singles. So imagine I have a guy who just gets a bunch of triples, no doubles, no home runs, and no singles, versus somebody who just gets home runs and singles. You might say it's unreasonable that this person gets no singles. Fine, if I want to give them some singles, I could just increase the number of singles of this player by the same amount and then there would be no change. If you want this person to get some um, doubles, I could do that to both. To get some home runs, I could do that to both. What really matters 
is this person is going to get more triples than the other person, and the other person is going to get more home runs and more singles. So can we figure out, you know, how to do that? So you did it beautifully in the case of the double triple versus the home run single. Yeah. It added up very nicely. One double, one triple is the same as one home run, one single. What should be the conversion factor here? How would we get the equations? So can anybody give me any relations? Yes. Well, we have to find the expected runs added. So well, well that, that would then be to answer the question of who's more valuable. But if I want to have the batting average and the slugging percentage to be the same, is there a way to do that? Is there a way to give some number of triples, home runs, and singles? Yes. Well, if you get for every two triples, you get one home run and two singles. Okay, so two triples would give you one home run and two singles. It would give you the same slugging contribution, but not the same batting average. Yes. Good. So three triples is two home runs in a single. So did you set up some systems of equation in your mind or did you just try a couple of things? So what relationship do we know must be true about N3, N4, and N1? Yes. So three times N3 is um, I'll actually write in the, in the better order. Um, I, I know you're saying that because of the stupid way I've been writing things. I'll write it as one times n one plus four times n four, and this is slugging uh, equal. Two. I'm sorry. Two and four. Two and four. Or four and four. Two. Oh no 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 no! I'm saying we're trying to write down the equations. The number of triples times three has to be the same as the number of singles times one plus the number of home runs times four. Because if you want them to have the same slugging, the, 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 right, this, is, this is the contribution to slugging from both. Now, what else do we know must be true? N3 equals just N1 plus N4. Batting average is equal. So not surprisingly, this is going to give us an underdetermined system. We have two equations, but three unknowns. So if we multiply the second by three, this yields, um, there's so many different reasons. Well, I could just subtract. And if I subtract, I would get, um, two and three equals three and four. And we also know that N one equals N three minus N four. So once I tell you N four, I can introduce N three, which then gives me N one. So So given N4, that yields N3, which then yields N1. And we just want to do things in such a way that we get integer values. So uh, did, I, did I do any mistakes or? Have I made a mistake or does this look okay? Okay. So what would be a good value to take for N4? So I could do two. Why is two a good thing to do? Okay. So by taking in four to be two and not one, 
it's going to be easily divisible by two. Things are going to be fine. So we'll take n4 to be two. Then that yields that n3 is going to be equal to three, which then yields that n1 is equal to three minus two is one. So it's uh, two triples. Was it three triples? No, three triples. Three triples versus two home runs and a single. And again, it's perfectly fine to be able to just look at this and see what the answer is, but it's nice to be able to just write something down a little bit more formally. This is supposed to be a class that has linear algebra as a prerequisite. It's nice to actually show you a system of equations that we have to solve so that you know, we don't have to be lucky and just see divine inspiration. We could, of course, have also just set up with n4 equals one, then we would get n3 equals 1.5 and n1 would be 0.5. And then in that case, we then just multiply everything by the smallest number we need to make everything an integer. And this gives us the exchange rate. So for every three triples, we replace it with two home runs in a single. So you will have two batters that will have the same average, same on base percentage, same slugging. Who do you think is more valuable? And again, we haven't done the full calculation. We know the relative value of the triple versus the home run. We've been you know, doing this for a while. Um, you know, in terms of you know, what their values are, we can look at the expected triple gain is a 1.033. The expected home run gain is a 1.42. So three triples would give us about 3.1. Two home runs would give us about 2.8. So it's how much is that single worth? 3.1 versus 2.8. This. So we have three triples. Is approximately 3.1. Two home runs is approximately 2.84. Is a single worth at least uh, 0.26. So again, we haven't done the full analysis. We've just done enough to look at you know, the triple versus the home run. That was the easy case. We, we're not taking into account anything here. So now we've reduced it to a, a very nice question. Do you think a single is worth 0.26? Given that a triple is worth 1.033, that's saying a single is about a quarter of the value of a triple. So one of my friends uh, had a beautiful comment about COVID. COVID was the sweet spot for pandemic. If it was more deadly, it would be clear what to do. If it was less deadly, it would be clear what to do. But where it is, ugh, you know, do we shut things down? Do we have shutdowns that are targeted and have you know, young kids who don't seem to be as susceptible to bad consequences? Do we have things more open for them? It's a place where it's hard to tell what's the right thing to do, at least in the beginning. Over here, if, this, if I needed a value of a single of a 0.8, would it be clear what the answer is? Do you think a single is worth 0.8? No, so if it was as high as 0.8, we know that you know, this is not the way to go. What if it said, we only need a single to be worth 0.05? <laughs> if we only need 0 0.05, sure. 0 0.26, well, a third of a triple. Eh. You know, this is less than a third of a triple. So I will 
let you think for a moment. I will decide which way I'm going to vote. And then you ready to vote or? Did you have a question or? Oh, no, go, go, go for it. All right, all right. So if you think that the two home ones and the single is more valuable than the three triples, raise your hand. All right, so it looks like it's you're pretty uniform. What was your comment? Well, I was thinking like one triple compared to three singles. I mean, very service level. If you assume like back to back. Right. A triple. I mean, this isn't really- well, No, triple, no, and- But like one person on third versus base is loaded. Right. Yeah. But again, we were trying to keep the batting yeah. average the same. And so because we're trying to keep the batting average the same, we have to be careful because you can't just do one triple. But there are some models, you know, we heard in Wednesday's lecture, you know, the way to try to model a baseball game with, you know, runs scored, runs allowed using viable distributions and whatnot. There are other attempts that are done using such as like geometric. And some of these simple models, you know, if you assume the only hits are singles, it takes a while before you can score a run because you've got to get four singles before you finally start to score, but now you can score a lot. And so there's this huge startup cost. And so uh, I will send an email that, you know, for those of you who weren't as active in terms of you know, providing stuff like this, I want to get a full analysis of the relative weights of singles, doubles, triples, and home runs so that we can hopefully answer this question of, you know, these two players, is one more valuable than the other? And if so, how much? Can you assume if we're, if we're looking at singles and doubles for now, at least, that you only move one? So we, we, so we can make that as a simplifying assumption, just to keep things simple. Single, everybody moves one base. Double, everybody moves two bases. And you never get out on the base. And you never get out on the base path. Yes. And then we'll put in more reasonable stuff. But I think there's a potential for real paper here that we could, you know, if this hasn't been done and I've done some quick searching, could actually be published and presented at a conference. And again, 3% may not seem like a lot, but if you're thinking about just earnings and whatnot, a small gain consistently over time, if you can do 3% better than the other person, this is how you get a Walmart. I'm serious. Walmart got its dominance by better uh, distribution chains. All right, so this is a good place to stop.